Welcome to Cardiology in our round. Um, I am fortunate that Greg's not here, so I get to introduce one of my favorite people in the division for Cardiology in our rounds today. So we have Dr. Francis Kim, who is a professor in the division and has been here for a number of years. <laughs> uh, he is a West Coast guy. If you look at his CV, he's major most of the time or all the time in the West Coast. He did his bachelor's uh, in chemistry at University of California at Berkeley, did uh, medical school at UCSF, followed by internship, and came here to do uh, uh, internal medicine residency, followed by cardiology fellowship. He has been on faculty since. 1999, when he was acting uh, instructor, became assistant professor, um, associate professor, and professor in 2017. Um, he uh, has a very robust research program that's been continuously funded since he's been a faculty. Um, he has trained uh, numerous uh, trainees, including six cardiology fellows, several medical students, and postdocs. Um, he currently holds uh, three R01s and a co-PI and another, and he is a PI for our T32 program here. That's very important uh, for our fellows to get advanced training in research. And I was on that program several years ago. Uh, he's very well published, uh, has uh, more than 60 papers in um, in journals such as JAMA, Diabetes, Circulation, ATVB, and uh, has a very unique uh, aspects of research where he has very basic looking at animal models and then looking at um, uh, clinical trials and patients. It's kind of very uh, unique research program. I think he's gonna talk about a very important topic uh, that came up three times when I was in service last week at Harborview. So I look forward to his talk. Thank you, Fareed. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so I wanna start this talk off with um, one of the first patients I ever took care of when I was attending at Harborview was a, a man who, he was 67, he just had lunch with a bunch of his high school friends at the Metropolitan Grill, and he was walking back to the ferry dock. Before he got to the ferry dock, he collapsed. Um, he had cardiac arrest, from ventricular fibrillation. Um, he had bystander CPR. Um, the fire department was a couple blocks away. He got prompt response. And he was brought to Harborview um, where he was in the CCU for three days before he died. And this is pretty common for cardiac arrest and over 400,000 people in the US die every year from cardiac arrest. And the majority, even though sometimes they have successful resuscitation, um, they never wake up. So many, many years ago, uh, Myron Weisfeld and uh, Lance Becker proposed a three-phase model for cardiac arrest. And it's kind of a good model to think about um, how we treat these patients. So within the first um, 30 seconds to 90 seconds following the uh, stoppage of your heart, um, he coined this as the electrical phase, where the most important therapy at this time is prompt defibrillation. And if this happens, um, your survival, if you make it to the hospital, is well over 70%. So this is a very critical phase, but most patients, it takes a lot longer before um, help arrives. The second phase that he coined was a hemodynamic phase. So this phase, which is anywhere from 90 seconds after the pulse stops to a couple minutes, um, the focus of the therapy is on restoring coronary flow as well as flow to the brain. So CPR is the most important um, aspect of treatment at this phase. About one or two minutes after the stoppage of the heart begins this long phase called the metabolic phase. And then this phase can last anywhere from a couple of minutes after, but usually goes all the way up to about 48 hours after the stoppage of the, of the heart. And this phase is very important, but it's most people who end up in this, we don't have good therapies. 
So some of the things that people are doing currently, one is therapeutic hypothermia. Um, there's a big focus on ICU care. How do we manage these patients in the ICU? Um, there's been uh, studies on early cath, and then finally of using ECMO to support these patients during this metabolic phase. So physiologically, what happens during this metabolic phase? A lot of bad things happen to the brain, which eventually prevent it from waking up or surviving. So one of the first things is an inflammatory response, which is pretty aggressive, which leads to a lot of tissue destruction. There's membrane permeability changes, so the neurons and the supporting um, cells around the neurons become very permeable and they start leaking. Um, there's a profound coagulation activation, so immediately after cardiac arrest, the blood just starts to clot. Um, I'm going to talk more about ischemia reperfusion injury, but in the neuron level, there's a massive influx of calcium, and there's a lot of release of glutamate, which can um, damage the neurons. So all of these factors lead ultimately to brain cell death um, and then death of the person. So there's been some therapies that have been looking at these um, uh, pathways to see if we can stop these. Um, there's been some interest in using steroids post-resuscitation to block the inflammatory response. There's been some observational studies of the people who have been on Plavix or even Coumadin. Some of these people in some observation studies seem to do better. So there's some interest in attacking the coagulation system in the post-resuscitation period. There's been some clinical trials many years ago looking at calcium channel blockers to prevent neural injury, but a lot of these trials really never panned out. One of the global therapies that um, has been around for the last 15 years is therapeutic hypothermia. But physiologically, a lot of these things will block a lot of these negative uh, factors in the brain. Um, so this, what other people are looking for are some global therapies that will affect all these different pathways. So I'm gonna focus on ischemia reperfusion injury. So in this talk, um, I'm gonna just go over some of the basics of what we understand about ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, a therapy, um, potential therapy of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a molecule that a lot of people, including our lab, is very interested in a lot of its beneficial effects um, in terms of vascular health. But I think nitric oxide also has some very important um, beneficial effects um, during ischemia reperfusion. I'm going to talk a little bit about our trial, which um, we are undertaking on using sodium nitrite for cardiac arrest. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to touch on some mechanistic studies in terms of how nitric oxide uh, might be beneficial. So this is um, a figure taken from uh, a review article from Ravi and Graham Nichol uh, published a few years ago, um, describing what happens um, in the neuron. So there's no blood flow initially. The neuron experiences ischemia. So one of the first things that happens is that there's a, a lot of release of glutamate, which then releases a lot of calcium, which is um, represented by these red dots. This influx of calcium and then all phases of being ischemic um, leads to a lot of um, negative factors, which releases free radical formation of superoxide. So during reperfusion, when blood flow is re restored, there's more oxygen going back into the neuron and into the blood vessel. And then this reperfusion leads to a lot of inflammatory cell activation, cytokine release, and also a generation of a lot of free radicals or superoxide. These all conspire to do a lot of deleterious effects. So even though you re uh, reperfuse the cell with oxygen, this root perfusion part leads to a lot of cell injury and ultimately cell death. So one of the main factors that you can find both during ischemia and during reperfusion is the generation of free radicals. So there's a lot of superoxide that's produced um, in, the, in the neurons, which ultimately lead to uh, cell death. So there's been a lot of exploration in terms of where do these superoxide molecules actually come from? So one of the profound and major um, releasing agents of superoxide is the mitochondria. So other enzymes in the cytosol also release superoxide, such as NADPH oxidase. But in animal studies and cellular studies, the main source of superoxide 
has been found to be um, mitochondria. So normally the mitochondria is important for ATP generation and it depends on generation of a proton gradient where protons are pumped into the inner part of the mitochondria and then these protons go back into the inner part and this generates ATP. If you go back to medical school biochemistry, this really depends on electron flow going down from complex one all the way down to complex four. So this is a normal process of what the mitochondria is supposed to be doing. During reperfusion, instead of doing this helpful thing of generating ATP, this area now starts to generate a lot of superoxide. So instead of making ATP, the mitochondria is now making a lot of superoxide. So one of the ideas that a lot of physiologists had was if you can block superoxide, perhaps you can block a lot of the uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. So some of the compounds that actually are very, very effective in blocking mitochondrial um, electron transport and possibly superoxide are these gases. So we have nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. And in animal studies, if you administer these gases into this animal, you can definitely reduce superoxide during ischemia reperfusion. So these gases um, are studied by um, many people. Um, they're really considered kind of pollution or toxic gases. So nitric oxide um, is found in the, um, in the atmosphere and it's, a, it's an important component of pollution that people study. Carbon monoxide is well known to people as an exhaust from um, automobiles. And then hydrogen sulfide is found in the sewer and swamps and it's the thing that smells like rotten eggs. But a lot of these gases are also produced by the cell and they have biologic effects. So nitric oxide is produced by nitric oxide synthase and it vasodilates the blood vessels. So it's very important in blood pressure regulation. It has anti-inflammatory effects. So the normal levels of um, nitric oxide uh, prevent um, inflammation. And in the mitochondria, it blocks flow in the mitochondria and reduces superoxide uh, formation. So similarly, other, these other gases, so carbon monoxide um, is actually a byproduct of hemoglobin degradation. So it's a normal thing that you can find um, in humans. And actually hydrogen sulfide is actually a byproduct and during um, the uh, formation of L-cysteine and a lot of protein synthesis, you can get hydrogen sulfide found inside the body. And all these things actually have some biological effects and are actually very, very protective in very low, low doses. So the idea was, well, it, there's a theoretical component to why, why these things might uh, work. And one of the first studies completed was in an animal model of cardiac arrest. So in mice or rats, um, you can't really induce ventricular fibrillation, but you can induce um, asystole or PEA. So a lot of times they use aphyxia or they give high doses of potassium. So in this first study, um, they, following cardiac arrest, um, they gave some mice just a placebo air and other mice inhaled nitric oxide. So you can see in the control group, the air, if you just look at um, days after cardiac arrest and just look at survival of these mice, you see a lot of the people, the mice that just got air, 40% um, survived. But if you look at the group that received nitric oxide, a fair number actually survived. So if you actually did a human study and saw survival curves like this for cardiac arrest, you'd be very, very thrilled because this is almost a 30 to 40% absolute survival benefit for using um, nitric oxide. So in this other panel, um, they looked at functional um, neurologic score. So the higher score is, is better. So they looked at these mice 24 hours after cardiac arrest in 96. And you can see that within the first 24 hours, there's not really much difference. But toward the end, if you wait 96 hours, the ones that got nitric oxide maintained their functional score and the ones that just got air started to do worse. And finally, uh, another aspect that uh, physiologists look at to look for brain injury is to look for cell death in the hippocampus. And if you have a lot of black or brown um, marked cells in the hippocampus, 
that suggests that there's a lot of uh, neuron death. So this is the group, the mice that got air. There's a lot of black or brown, which suggests there's a lot of cell death, where nitric oxide is not as much. So similarly, um, other people have done studies where they looked at hydrogen sulfide. So same mouse uh, model for cardiac arrest. Um, some got vehicle, and in this case, they got hydrogen sulfide. And you can see that the group that got hydrogen sulfide, all, nearly all of them survived, where these, a lot of them died. So this at least supports the idea that using nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, there's also data on carbon monoxide in rodent models, that these agents are very, very protective um, in terms of improving survival for cardiac arrest. So this is the data for hydrogen sulfide. Similarly, if you just look at the brain, um, there's a lot of dark spots suggesting a lot of cell death, but if you've got the hydrogen sulfide, there's very little cell death. So more supporting evidence that these, these, the hydrogen sulfide is very protective. So one question that we had um, many years ago, um, since I'm very interested in nitric oxide, is if you increase nitric oxide levels in the brain, will this improve neurologic outcomes following res resuscitation from cardiac arrest? So there are several approaches that you can use to improve nitric oxide. One is to use inhaled nitric oxide, um, but since most of the cardiac arrest occurs out in the field, and at home, out in the community, um, sometimes it's difficult to actually have canisters of gas that the paramedics are actually using. So this is one of the, ne the negative effects of possibly using inhaled nitric oxide. Another possibility is to use a drug or a compound that can be converted into nitric oxide. And one of these compounds is, that, is actually sodium nitrite. So there's some other drugs that we commonly use, such as nitroglycerin and sodium nitroglycerin. And these actually can act as nitric oxide donors. And some people have actually proposed that we should use sodium nitroglycerin um, during cardiac arrest. And in some animal models, it, it is actually pretty um, effective. Then finally, there's other drugs that can actually indirectly increase nitric oxide's effects. So an example of this is sildenafil, which can increase the effect of nitric oxide. So there are currently two human studies that are ongoing um, that are looking at nitric oxide as a potential therapy. So one um, is currently being done at the University of Pittsburgh by one of my um, colleagues and collaborators, Cameron Desfulian. So in this study, they're taking uh, patients who suffered out of hospital cardiac arrest. They're brought into the hospital and if uh, they're consensible and, and they agree, um, they get started on inhaled nitric oxide for 24 hours. So this trial is, is, is ongoing and should be completed by the end of next year. So in Seattle, um, our group has been looking at the use of sodium nitrate for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest as well. Um, this trial is ongoing. We, we just finished an enrollment um, uh, a couple months ago. So how does nitric oxide and nitrite actually, um, how, how, how does it work? So nitric oxide is produced by endothelial cells. Um, it's a gas that's released by the endothelial cells and synthesized by nitric oxide synthase. But as soon as it's released into the bloodstream, it's rapidly oxidized into nitrite. And then during a normal state where there's a lot of um, oxygenated hemoglobin, nitrite is further oxidized into nitrate. So um, this nitrite and nitrate concentration inside the blood is actually very useful. So in cardiovascular epidemiology, people actually measure nitrite and nitrite as an indirect measure of nitric oxide production. So nitrite and nitrate are commonly found and there's normal physiologic levels in the blood. One interesting thing that happens if you don't have any oxygen, so during total ischemia, so if you get during cardiac arrest, the oxygenated hemoglobin can actually convert nitrite into nitric oxide. So the idea is um, if I give sodium nitrite to a normal person 
Um, it's just rapidly oxidized and nitrite is given and it's just turned into nitrite and there's no harmful effects by giving the nitrite. If a, a person is ischemic, such as if you had a stroke, myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest, I give nitrite to this person, it gets converted into nitric oxide and nitric oxide in the animal studies is very, very protective. So this is a very good drug. It only works in the tissues uh, and the areas that are actually very, very ischemic. So to test this hypothesis, um, Cameron Desfoulian at the University of Pittsburgh did a similar mouse study where they used nitrite. So in this study, the nitrite was actually given during resuscitation of the mouse, and the mice either got placebo, um, so about 50% after CPR within a day, 50% of these mice um, actually died. Whereas the mice that actually got sodium nitrite um, during resuscitation, about 75% survived. So there's a 25% absolute difference in survival. And again, this isn't as good as the nitric oxide data, but this is very significant. And if I could tell you that this would translate into humans, um, this would be an incredible therapy um, that should be tested. And if it works, um, it would make a huge impact in how we treat these patients. So this is some of the histologic data um, that Cameron published back in 2009. So again, he delivered placebo and he delivered a lower dose of nitrite, uh, 1.85. He also delivered a higher dose of nitrite um, and then a really high dose of nitrite, uh, all versus placebo. So you can see in the placebo group, group that the pre-rest nitrite is about 1.1 micromolar. But post arrest, you can see that the nitrite levels actually fall in these mice. So this drops to about 0.64. So this really suggests that the nitrite is actually being consumed and being converted into nitric oxide. So the nitrite is actually going down during cardiac arrest. So in this group that got the 1.85, the post arrest following the nitrite infusion goes back up to about 1.0 micromolar. And this is very similar to the pre-arrest nitrite levels. So basically what you're doing by giving this dose is just replacing what's been lost or consumed. In this last panel, they got a lot higher dose. And one thing that you should notice is that the amount of damage in these animals is much higher than the placebo. So there's a dose effect that if you give too much nitrite, it actually causes harm. So it's not a totally wonderful drug, but if you give too much, um, you can cause a lot of uh, cell death. So nitrite um, is a common compound, but it's mostly found in how we preserve meats. So a lot of processed meats, if you don't add nitrite to these meats, they'll turn gray. So no one's gonna wanna eat gray bacon or gray ham. So nitrite has been added to our meats for a long time just to preserve um, the red color. The other place that you find a lot of nitrites it is in, um, in different vegetables. So beets and spinach have a tremendous amount of nitrites. And in the popular literature for nutrition, um, people have found that if you use nitrite before exercising, since it will ultimately produce a lot of nitric oxide, some people have advocated that it actually increases exercise performance, especially during endurance exercise. So there's uh, places, um, there's one near the uh, U Village, uh, Juju. Um, they actually have smoothies that they make from beets, which have a very high amount of nitrites, and people use these sometimes um, to improve their endurance. So the bad part of nitrite, um, it has a lot of bad press in that it's associated with uh, gastric cancer. So even though it's found in a lot of our um, you know, or processed meats, the FDA has actually set limits in terms of how much nitrite a person can consume. So in order to get to the FDA limit at one sitting, you would have to eat basically 19 pounds of cured meat. So in order to get these bad doses of nitrite, you have to consume a lot of processed meat at one time. Actually, the bad thing about nitrites is that if it's heated to a high temperature, it can actually cause uh, formation of nitros nitrosamine. 
which is very reactive and it can damage DNA and protein. And the one common place that you'll get high nitrosamines is if you fry your bacon. So the high heat will cause a lot of nitrosamines um, in the bacon. So in terms of our study, um, one thing that we um, were, were trying to determine is what is the target? How much of the nitrite do I have to give? And what is the target? So in a lot of animal studies um, that Cameron and I did, we found that a target of 10 to 20 micromolars within 10 to 15 minutes of ischemia reperfusion is kind of the optimal dose in terms of an endpoint when you just look at a neuronal cell death. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're actually replacing a deficit. So naturally following cardiac arrest, sodium nitrites fall, and basically we're replacing this deficit with our dose. So we think that a single dose is actually sufficient and a long-term infusion is, is really not necessary. So the idea would be that we would have the paramedics just give this one dose in the field during resuscitation, and then we would be done. So what are the risks of sodium nitrite? So paramedics actually do carry sodium nitrite um, in their units, and it's actually used for cyanide poisoning. So the doses they actually give are uh, 300 milligrams in one single dose. Um, our doses that we were contemplating are down in the 30 or 20, 40 milligram range. So it's about a tenfold less in terms of what the standard FDA approved use for sodium nitrite. So we also went in with the idea that blood levels, if we get over 200 micromolar are harmful. So that was kind of our uh, one area that we did want to get. In human um, studies, in normal humans, if you give doses of sodium nitrite, it does cause nitric oxide production, so you can lower the blood pressure. So in a lot of these patients, in healthy patients, you can lower the blood pressure by five to 10 millimeters of mercury uh, by actually giving the sodium nitrite. So um, this was our first study that we did, um, published a few years ago. Um, these were health um, patients that suffered out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, they were brought to Harperview. Um, after consent, uh, we gave them two doses of sodium nitrite. So based on normal patients, um, we knew that about 10 milligrams given IV push would achieve uh, plasma levels about 10 to 15 micromolars. But these are in healthy patients. So when we approached the FDA to get permission to do this study, they said, well, you need to start with this first 10 milligram dose and see what you get. And then as a control, as a safety, we want you to use a very small dose of nitrite, uh, which is one milligram. So in this study, we had um, three patients that actually received one milligram of sodium nitrite. Um, this is anywhere from 10 to 20 hours after they uh, had a hospital cardiac arrest. Um, one person received placebo, and the other three actually received this one milligram of nitrite. So we chose to monitor heart rate and uh, mean arterial blood pressure in the ICU to see if there's any significant hemodynamic effects in this population. So at one milligram, we didn't think anything would really happen. And in terms of placebo, in terms of hemodynamics, nothing did happen. And by giving this one uh, milligram dose, in only one patient, you got a very small bump in sodium nitrite about 20 to 30 minutes after this administration, where the placebo is in the red, the others, there's really no significant change. In this 10 milligram dose, we didn't see any significant hemodynamic effects. The placebo, there's two placebos, the green and the red one, but you can see that by just giving the 10 milligrams, only one person got up to about four micromolar which is really well below what we thought we needed to do is getting 10. You can see that a lot of these people um, actually got a very small bump. So the one thing that we did figure out by doing this very small trial is that the 10 milligram dose that we thought would work in normal people really does not work. I mean, people that suffered out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this is not surprising given that the sodium nitrite usually falls probably um, during cardiac arrest. 
So in 2017, um, we did a phase one study. So uh, we labeled our trial as SNOCAT, so sodium nitrite out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this was designed as a dose finding trial. So we enrolled 120 patients, and this was actually an open label trial. So um, since the 10 milligram didn't work, uh, we went back and used some rat models of cardiac arrest. And in order to achieve the 10 micromolar, the uh, 20 micromolar range, we found that a 25 milligram dose um, would probably get to this level. So we started off with a 25 milligram um, initial dose. But we built into our protocol that we would, uh, in real time, measure our pharmac pharmacokinetics and would wanted to see if we were actually getting to our 10 micromolar dose. And in our protocol, if this was not sufficient, um, we were able to increase the dose um, best based on our, our, our next best guess. So when the paramedics go out to, the, um, to respond to a cardiac arrest, they do their standard protocol. So they start CPR, they start ACLS, they defibrillate if necessary, an IV is placed. Um, sometimes an IV or interosseous line is placed and the patient is intubated. And as soon as these things are done, we ask them to either give, to give the sodium nitride um, through the IV line. So we chose a few um, endpoints. Since the main thing that sodium nitride does is lower the blood pressure, we were worried that it might have some bad hemodynamic effects. So one of the endpoints we picked was rate of rearrest. So if there's some bad hemodynamic effects, these patients might have a rearrest in the field. So that was one of their endpoints. We looked at the rate of return of spontaneous circulation or ROSP. We also um, monitored the use of pressors by the paramedics in the field. And sometimes um, the paramedics were able to get blood pressure in the field. So um, this is the outline of the trial. Um, we actually ended up having two different dose groups. So the 25 milligram dose was not sufficient. So based on um, uh, recalculations by the pharmacologist, we increased the dose to 60 milligrams. So entry into this uh, study, um, they had cardiac arrest, so no pulse in the field. We took both people that had ventricular fibrillation and non-ventricular fibrillation. They had to have an IV access and they were comatose in the field. So we excluded patients that had known DNR and age of less than 18. So since this is an emergency study, um, we actually got permission from the FDA to do a waiver of consent. So a lot of these, all these patients did not consent to this study. Um, after they were brought to the hospital, um, if they survived, uh, we contacted or approached their family and notified them that they were actually in this study. So technically this study is a waiver of consent where the patients did not agree to be in the study. We asked a lot of these patients or their families if they survived, if they agreed to continue participation and nearly 95% agreed. So overwhelmingly the community, especially in Seattle, is very willing to participate um, in this study. So we had two groups, um, 25 milligrams and 60 milligrams. The rate of return of spontaneous circulation was about 50%. So over half of these patients um, never survived. They never, um, before even they got to the hospital, um, they died. And then these are our survival um, outcomes for each group. And this is on par with what we find um, in Seattle. So this is some of the patient demographics for the study. So we had in this column the, the low gross, low dose of uh, sodium nitrite and a higher dose at 60. And then as a comparative group, um, we, we took as historical controls all the cardiac arrests um, that the paramedics attended to in Seattle in between 2014 and 2017. So in terms of return of spontaneous circulation, which was one of our endpoints, historically, this was about 60%, but in our trial, we were down around 50%, and the rate of rearrest um, was about 35% historically, and in these two groups, we got 32 and 
Um, if you look at survival to discharge amongst patients with VF, historically it's about 48%. And we saw some signal in terms that the VF patients, there was an increase. But again, these were not, it's hard to do statistical comparisons on this because we're having a historical control. And this is not a randomized trial. But we presented these data to the DSMB to see if we could continue doing these types of studies. Um, and after some discussion, um, they felt that the benefits would probably um, outweigh the potential risks and what the, the rate of ROSC and whatnot was other things that they uh, asked us to continue to monitor. So these are actually blood levels of um, sodium nitrite um, in our patients that receive the 25 milligram dose and the 60 milligram dose. So the ones that are in red actually died in the field. The ones that had green um, were the ones that had return of spontaneous circulation. So these dotted lines are theoretical um, uh, drug levels that we expected to see um, in this population. So one thing that you can notice is that in the red, the people that um, died in the field, there's a tremendous range in terms of the sodium nitrite levels in people that are that, are, um, that basically have no circulation. So one person as high as 100 and some that are very, very low. It's not really surprising that a lot of these patients, they don't have a circulation. So if you give the drug, it may not, it won't circulate. So these drug levels are actually the first that have ever been reported in terms of people that don't have circulation. We give drugs like lidocaine and epinephrine, but we don't really understand what's really going on with the pharmacokinetics. The one thing that we did find is that that 25 milligram, a lot of these green dots are underneath this 10 micromolar dose. So based on this data, um, the pharmacologist recommended that we go to this higher dose. And we see a similar pattern in the 60 milligram dose, but there are more of these green dots above this 10 micromolar line. So when um, the pharmacologist uh, we did the calculations for our dose. We a priori um, wanted to have our dose between 10 to 20 micromolars, five to 10 minutes um, after the dose was given. So based on these calculations, if we get 25 milligrams at 10 minutes, we would be between four and 11. At 45, we'd be between seven and 21, and 60 would be almost 10 to 28. So based on these data, we pick these two doses, 45 and 60 milligrams, as kind of being the optimal dose um, for our study. So um, we moved on to our next study, which was of, of SNOWCAT, which was um, a safety and efficacy study. So in this study, um, we enrolled 1,500 patients. So we expected about 600 to survive um, to the emergency department. So a lot of people would wonder why we enrolled so many patients. It's actually we're enrolling 1,500, uh, but only 600 will probably have data that um, we can actually analyze because most of the patients uh, would not survive. Um, this is a randomized, it's blinded, and it's placebo control. So we had a placebo group. So 500 received placebo, 500 received 45 milligrams, and 500 received 60 milligrams. The main safety endpoint that we chose was survival to the emergency department. And our main efficacy endpoint was survival to discharge. So this trial started in um, January, February of 2018. We enrolled our last patient in September of 2019. And we're still collecting some outcomes data and we'll um, do our uh, data analysis to see um, how our endpoints turned out. So I can't, I don't have any data to present in terms of how these patients actually did, um, but hopefully soon we'll have these data. The last part um, I wanted to talk about um, is kind of some ideas in terms of mechanisms um, for how nitric oxide might be, might be protected. So nitric oxide, um, in a lot of different um, cell culture models and animal models is actually very, very protective. So nitric oxide has anti-inflammatory properties, so it reduces inflammation. 
it's well known in endothelial cells is that it prevents um, endothelial cell permeability, so the vascular doesn't become leaky. Um, I've shown you some data saying that it protects against ischemia reperfusion. Um, in cardiac myocytes, nitric oxide actually prevents um, sometimes a release or influx of calcium. Um, so it may have some properties where it reduces calcium influx. Um, in humans, it's very difficult um, to do these types of studies. And one area that um, we were starting to focus on um, is to use uh, the study of the metabolites um, in the circulation so, or metabolomics. So um, what we want to do is to measure the metabolites. Um, so we can measure glycolysis products, Krebs cycle products in the blood. And the idea is that in global ischemia, a lot of these metabolites are going to be altered. Um, and then possibly does a global ischemia such as cardiac arrest, is it different from someone who suffers a myocardial infarction or a stroke? So is the metabolite signature actually different? And one idea is that if we give sodium nitrite, perhaps we're um, altering or restoring some of the metabolite pattern that's upset during global ischemia. So that was kind of the idea of why we wanted to do a metabolomic study. So this is data. Um, uh, the metabolomics are run by Dan Raftery um, at South Lake Union. We had a group of normal patients represented in blue. Um, we had some patients in this uh, teal and um, blue that were basically had stroke. And then we had some patients in this green um, who had cardiac arrest who did okay. And then some that had red who um, actually died. So these are metabolites that are all measured. So um, this is a heat map. So the blue, the, the levels of the metabolites actually are decreased. And if they're red or orange, they're actually increased. So you can see in a normal person, um, this is what the pattern kind of looks like. Most of it is blue. There's some that are red. But if you look at people that suffered myocardial infarction and some stroke, you know, with kind of local ischemia, you can see a different difference in pattern um, in terms of color. A lot of these things, metabolites, actually start to increase. In cardiac arrest, since it's global ischemia, there's uh, significant changes in a lot of these metabolites. So a lot of these are, are significantly different. And there's really not that much difference so far in this small N in terms of what happens if um, some people do better or some people do worse. We thought there might be a different signature, but obviously we have to do um, a lot more of these patients um, to get uh, uh, more in. So how would nitrite or nitric oxide actually affect the metabolites? So as I told you before, nitric oxide during ischemia can be converted into nitrite, but during ischemia, deoxyhemoglobin can convert it into nitric oxide. So nitric oxide itself um, can actually cause the formation of nitrothiols, which are very reactive. And then these, um, this compound can actually modify proteins. So it can modify the proteins, it can modify lipids. And we think that this modification may actually alter um, the function of the proteins and then could alter signaling pathways um, in the brain. So, um, does this actually happen? Can we measure um, sodium nitrothiols? So these are nitrite levels for a couple of patients that received the one milligram and then the two milligram, I mean the 10 milligram dose, so the nitrite levels actually go up. But if we actually measure nitrothiols in the same population, you can see that the nitrothiols actually increase substantially um, in the 10 milligram dose. So we, we uh, think that the patients that got the 25 45 or 60 milligrams should have a lot more of these nitrothiols. So does this actually alter proteins? Um, so this is an experiment that Cameron Desfolian did in a rat model of cardiac arrest. So um, they had, there was two goals. So some of these rats had nothing happen to them. Um, some had cardiac arrest and received placebo. Some had cardiac arrest and then uh, received nitrite. So the first part, if you just look at the uh, red and the purple, are do some of these um, uh, metabolites, 
actually changed during cardiac arrest versus sham. So you can see that following cardiac arrest, these enzymes actually go down. Um, these uh, enzymes in the glycolysis pathway actually increase. So there is some evidence that these metabolites actually change during ischemia. We also look to see if the nitrite could actually um, nitrosylate any of these proteins. So one of these proteins or enzymes in the glycolysis pathway is hexokinase. You could see that there's evidence that even in the baseline state that this enzyme is actually not nitrosylated. If you give sodium nitrite, it actually changes the nitrosylation levels. So on a theoretical level, it seems like um, studying this pathway and looking at the metabolites um, could be a fruitful way. So um, during this last study of SNOWCAT2, uh, we've collected about 300 blood samples, uh, which we will process and then measure uh, metabolite. So I'd like to end um, by kind of focusing out of this uh, metab uh, metabolic phase. And it's just not drugs that we can give that may have an effect, but there's a lot of other things that we do clinically that may impact the metabolic phase. So hypothermia, um, it's been very well studied, it's been applied to a lot of patients around the world, and it's, been, it's demonstrated some benefit in terms of improving survival um, from ventricular fibrillation. So this is a pretty standard uh, treatment in the ICU now. There's a lot of interest in early cath um, for these patients. Um, there's been a few trials, one released this year, which actually suggests that cathing people with non-ST segment elevation MI acutely really does not help um, a lot of these patients in terms of survival. So maybe early cath, it's, that's probably still an open question, but it may not be beneficial. There's been a lot of interest in the use of ECMO, so um, totally supporting the circulation from cardiac arrest, and then this would uh, eventually help um, these patients survive. A lot of the initial studies were um, done in Japan and they were very, very um, beneficial. But you can imagine that using ECMO is very difficult because it requires a pretty large hospital team and there's a, lot, a pretty steep learning curve in terms of patient selection as well as actually do, um, doing this, um, the ECMO properly. So this is still an ongoing question. Um, I'm interested in using drugs to modify this phase. So I've told you some about sodium nitrite, nit nitric oxide. Um, there's a lot of interest in using prednisone. There's been some small studies in Europe that should suggest that perhaps prednisone may improve um, um, outcomes in the cardiac arrest population. There's a current ongoing pilot study using thiamine, uh, which is also another kind of metabolic uh, regulator. It's a very simple drug to give and it's, it's pretty safe. So this idea of using a, a drug cocktail to kind of preserve the brain or preserve the heart, um, I think it's gonna be an important area and there's a lot of uh, potential for exploration. So I'll end with um, my fellow Snowcat um, investigators. Um, everyone knows Peter. Um, I'd like to uh, particularly thank Michelle and Deb who are my research nurses that worked with me for a long time. They've been extremely valuable in um, conducting our study. Uh, Chuck and Suzanne are, are statisticians and Cameron is my colleague um, at the University of um, Pittsburgh. I'd like to kind of end in terms of what the, the local community um, has actually contributed to um, cardiac arrest research. And um, Leonard Cobb, um, who retired from our division um, many years ago and Michael Copas, um, they started Medic One um, over 30 years ago, um, and this really highlights the importance of the EMS system, bystander CPR, um, how we take care of these patients uh, pre-hospital that really impact um, outcomes for survival for cardiac arrest. And um, the work that they've done has really translated to Seattle King County have, having one of the highest survival rates for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest um, in the entire world. So this is kind of a testament to their work. Um, but more importantly, um, they laid the foundation uh, for training uh, of the paramedics 
and also developing the infrastructure um, for actually doing a lot of the pre-hospital research. And there's very few places in the world that um, I had the opportunity to actually work and test my hypothesis using sodium nitride or, or hypothermia. So it's really a lot of the work that they did that set the infrastructure that allows us to actually test a lot of these therapies. Um, Peter Kudenchuk um, has done a lot of work on amiodarone, and he actually put amiodarone on the map and is, is now used in ACLS. Um, Jeannie Poole and Peter have also done a lot of work in terms of uh, waveform analysis, in terms of ventricular fibrillation. So a lot of their work has been very important as impacted um, the electrical phase of, of cardiac arrest. Um, Tom Ray uh, and Hallstrom um, did a study on mechanical CPR um, in Seattle King County. Um, Peter Kudenchuk and uh, Tom Ray are also interested in using air different strategies for airway management in terms of how that impacts cardiac arrest. Um, Al Hallstrom actually did a large study in terms of using public access defibrillators and how it impacts survival um, for uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, our group has studied pre-hospital hypothermia. I've talked to you about Snowcat. Um, Graham Nichol, um, who's an ER physician at Harborview, is interested in steroids, and he has a proposal um, looking at this. And he's also interested in another thing called ischemic uh, preconditioning. Um, this is a thing where you can um, put the blood pressure cuff up to a high level to cause ischemia in the limb, but this has actually been shown to actually protect from ischemia in the heart and also the brain. So these are kind of ongoing um, ideas and studies that are in the pipeline. And finally, um, Nana has done a lot of work in studying the genetics of uh, sudden cardiac death in the community. Um, David Siskovic, uh, many, many years ago, started uh, uh, CABS, which is a cardiac arrest blood study. So the paramedics actually collect blood um, from patients who suffer out of hospital cardiac arrest and this has provided a lot of uh, genetic information, um, which has able um, Nana and other groups to study the genetics of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So the university here has done a wonderful job in terms of impacting and treating out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, so I wanted at the end of my talk just to uh, um, highlight um, the wonderful work that other people here are doing. So I'd like to end my talk there and thank you for your attention. I have a question for you since we're going through a similar process. In the, I don't know if it was the phase one B trial, you described the, the uh, 15 versus 60 milligram doses. Why did you choose not to use a placebo and go with that historical control? Um, the, the reason I ask is because if you look at some of the numbers, you had pointed out some of the positive benefits, but there was also sort of a signal about perhaps um, less survival than the 60 milligram dose. And then you say, well, were some of the other benefits related to the sexual population um, not making it? Um, the main reason why we, we didn't have a placebo group is because uh, simply of the numbers. Um, <clears throat> when we were discussing the design of the trial, um, we were not allowed to enroll a lot of patients. So we wanted to get, oh, our main priority was to get the pharmacologic data because we really needed that. So that's the way we designed. And initially when we presented the trial for publication, we, we didn't include a historical control because it's statistically it's very difficult to do. And we just presented the, the, the outcomes from the two different drugs, uh, drug doses. But um, they said, we want the historical controls in there. So that's why we kind of... And were you able to get post-mortem data on any of the patients that you enrolled? Uh, no. No. Uh, there is a question. Uh, following up on the 
all of our life um, relatives. How do you bring those people? And how about the so um, we argued about this many years ago about when the best time to give the drug. So you have to give the drug before um, you get the reperfusion to get this maximal benefit. So that's why um, our group is really focused on paramedic delivery. Um, so unfortunately with the nitric oxide um, study, they're actually starting the inhaled nitric oxide after hospital admission. So it's like kind of our first study with sodium nitrite. So it may not have a beneficial effect, but we'll have to see what the data is. Because all the animal studies, these drugs are delivered during CPR. So that, that's when the drug really needs to be delivered. Yeah, that, um, in the resuscitation community, that's a big debate now in terms of patient selection. Um, when we did our power calculations, um, we we weren't sure if we'd be underpowered because the PA survival in asystole um, is probably five to ten percent at, at best. So you would need a tremendous number of patients to see a difference. But um, the, the other side is that the paramedics need to have a pretty straightforward and clean protocol. And if you start subdividing patient, patients into VF and non-VF, it makes it kind of hard sometimes. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Use that as a scientific model so that we demonstrate the open cancer. My point of this is that that laboratory assumption is important in the election next Tuesday. So if you live in King County, you'll get the vote on the levy that supports many one throughout the county. So just remember this is what it does besides serve thousands of patients every day. Here in, in, in town. Yeah. I'm interested whether the nitrate therapy is directed more at the heart or the brain. And the other question I have is does the blood brain barrier have anything to do with the access that your systemic administration? Um, that's a good um, question. The We've actually, or Cameron has measured sodium nitrite um, in the CSF as well. So um, during ischemia or global ischemia, a lot of the blood brain barrier and permeability actually changes. So, you know, different drugs, but he's actually measured um, levels of sodium nitrite in the CSF in rats after that. So we do think it will go into, into the brain, um, probably not at the same dose uh, levels, but it does go in there. Um, that is true. There have been a few small clinical trials using sodium nitrite um, for prior to doing a coronary intervention for acute MI. So the doses they actually use are very, very low. But there's some interest because it, it does have effects in, in animal models of myocardial infarction and stroke. Sodium nitrite has been shown to have some benefit. Thank you.